University to, to 23. So we are welcome today to Cesar Santiago Molina and Andres Cuevas to our panel, as me also is going to be uh, discussed in this uh, forum. So the, the, the subject today is digital education and mega universities. So we have uh, a lot of experiences right now in the national university and also Cesar is going to, to uh, share with us the experience in Qatar in the, for, from the University of Qatar. So I must to welcome you, Cesar, to our university. And I'm really glad also to, uh, to remember that the Observatorium of Relation of US and Mexico is also collaborate with us. So I also want to thanks to Santiago and Andres for joining us to our discussion. So we have four presentations, uh, each of us. Uh, are going to take 10 or 15 minutes to present our main ideas. And then we have two rounds of questions uh, to, for include the public principally. So everyone who wants to ask something in the, in the forum, please write a question on our chat. And uh, also, if you want to, um, to, to ask something in the YouTube, you, you can ask there. So I want to first uh, say that uh, Cesar is our first speaker. So thank you, Cesar. And I'm, I'm more, more than glad to see you again here in this forum. Likewise, thank you, Barbara. Thank you for the invitation. And uh, I hope that I'll be able to share with you our experience for, this, uh, for these hard times. Uh, we'll uh, start with a brief presentation about the uh, the university, and uh, you know, so that you get to know um, where we are. Uh, we have quite a, a varied audience, so just a quick presentation about the university itself, and then, uh, of course, discuss our strategy, what we have done uh, uh, during these times, and uh, and then answer your questions if you have any any questions. So uh, let me first uh, share my. Um, presentation. Uh, can you all see my screen? Great. So um, basically, we are in the state of Qatar. Qatar is in the Middle East. You can see it here. It's this small point and the uh, Persian Gulf. Um, uh, Qatar University is the number one university uh, in, in Qatar. Of course, we are the national university. Uh, now, the, the Qatari, you have to know that the uh, Qatari uh, uh, society is, um, um, you know, uh, quite a varied society. Uh, the demographics are quite varied. Uh, the national university is the only national university uh, in town. We have also another big uh, compound of universities, which is Education City which is quite next, uh, next door to us. Uh, it has international campuses uh, that are in town. So um, uh, this is our, now when, when Paula sent out this mega universities uh, announcement, I was, I was smiling because you know, <laughs> from a Mexican point of view or a you know, worldwide even point of view, this is not really a mega university, but you have to understand that for the context of Qatar, uh, this is uh, mostly 90% of the um, higher ed, uh, uh, you know, um, population, because we are um, a small country with a limited population, 2 million uh, overall, uh, a lot of expats. So this is basically, this uh, corresponds to 90% of the higher education scheme of, uh, of Qatar. Uh, we have, of course, a list of research centers that are, uh, you know, ex excellence research centers that you can see they range, basically they range around the priorities of the uh, Qatari government. Um, Qatar is uh, not an oil, but an LNG producer, uh, liquefied natural gas. Of course, this has a lot of impacts on, in, on its environment. And of course, it causes a lot of changes on the society itself because uh, there are a lot of uh, you know, opportunities for, for young people. And 
these centers uh, make us, you know, help us at least um, understand how these changes are affecting the Qatari society and how to channel things uh, in, be in better uh, places. Like, for instance, the impact of the gas extraction on the uh, environment, uh, the impact on the society, and all of these things. Um, in terms of the uh, rankings, of course, this has to be mentioned so that you know that Qatar University has been improving in the rankings in the Times Higher Education and the QS rankings. I'm mentioning this because it's, this is basically due to our international collaboration on research part and our international outlook and visibility. Uh, of course, all the, you know, the region in general has uh, very good universities and they're all uh, striving to do well in, in rankings. The, uh, the one thing that we pride ourselves in is the fact that our ranking improvement is basically due to the international outlook, both in the level of um, Qatar in general as a state open, the most open state in the region for international collaboration and, and, and you know, participating in international uh, events. Uh, one example that we were talking about is like the hosting of the uh, Football World Cup in 2022. It will be the first country in the region to do that. And uh, at Qatar University also with uh, the uh, presence of the Qatar National Research Fund, which is a big fund provided by the state of Qatar, similar to what you have in the US at the NSF, um, where you can, uh, we can partner with universities abroad, with centers, uh, research centers abroad on a common interest in research. And uh, you know, the, the fund can be uh, split in between Qatar and the um, countries abroad. We will be able to talk about this uh, later on if you are interested. Now, uh, coming to the topic that we want to talk about, uh, which is the impact of COVID-19 on our uh, you know, uh, way of work. Uh, the um, university had started since 2017 a new transformation strategy which included uh, all of these uh, you know, uh, components. I will focus on the dig digital transformation part uh, so that you can see that anyways, initially we had um, envisaged at some point to go to digital transformation. And we're talking about campus and education. So we were thinking of moving anyways to uh, more digitization in our day-to-day -day, uh, life at work at Qatar University. Uh, what this pandemic did is that, in fact, it reorganized the priorities for us. So uh, the strategy was 2017-2022, and it included, as I said, all of these components. Uh, suddenly, digital transformation became one of the most important and most pressing subjects to, to tackle. So what happened uh, to us during this pandemic? Uh, we had, to, of course, uh, you, you might know or you might not know that uh, in our region, the um, pandemic came in a bit uh, late, uh, earlier than uh, the uh, uh, Americas, but later than other uh, countries in the world. So basically, we had to confine uh, in March uh, 2020. Uh, we started our confinement then. So basically, before that, we had a normal uh, you know, life in terms of what well, what was the uh, pre-new normal life, which is that students were continuing their studies uh, normally. They had just finished their first semester, including all the uh, exams. They finished every, and they were preparing to come back for the spring semester. Uh, the uh, pandemic, as you know, started uh, increasing worldwide, and the Qatari government had uh, uh, started to be proactive in the sense that it didn't want to have a widespread uh, now, of course, later on, we were not able to, uh, to uh, control it totally, uh, especially in, in some uh, circles of the Qatari population. But uh, we, uh, we did overall, we, we think that we did a good job in uh, not totally uh, having a total lockdown. That's I'm talking about the, uh, you know, the country overall. Uh, and uh, uh, this was basically due to a model that is very similar to what you will see here uh, that uh, Qatar University adopted. So what we've done is that we had adopted a, a crisis scheme. We had, of course, a risk management team. That's not news to anyone. You all have these in any country of the world in any um, setup. We have a risk management team. What was created was this higher committee for health and safety, which mirrored the higher committee for health and safety created at the uh, level of the state of Qatar. Uh, this one, this committee is headed by the president and includes people that usually in the hierarchy would not directly be able to have access to the president in terms of day-to-day -day life. 
So that committee uh, enabled us to have the IT director, the uh, facilities director, the international affairs director directly meeting with the president of the university and of course the VPs and all the decision makers, uh, mainly like two or three times a week, uh, which enabled us also to uh, give our point of view and to receive uh, directives on uh, how to be able to help the university to uh, switch to online learning. Uh, that, of course, committee had uh, several components, which were uh, subcommittees uh, that would be formed after uh, the agreement uh, on, on the general directives uh, were given during the overall committee. Um, basically, the, the main two uh, things that we were able to um, establish out of this was to decide on what to use in terms of platforms very quickly. And you can see that we, we went for Blackboard Collaborate Ultra and Echo 360 Personal Capture and to have swift intervention teams. Uh, that would, these teams would be pedagogical, they would be uh, facilities, they would be um, IT teams. So these were uh, small teams that would be able to, uh, that had um, a lot of uh, responsibilities, but also um, had a bigger, uh, wider scope of work. So they didn't have to go through the normal channel of uh, standardized operating procedures. They didn't have to, uh, uh, you know, uh, write an email, wait for approvals, and then uh, get back to, to do something. They had the budget and they had the capacity of acting uh, quickly on decisions taken at the university level. So uh, that, of course, enabled us to move very quickly from uh, uh, normal, and you know, we are a tradi the traditional university. We are basically a teaching institution. Uh, so uh, like any national university, uh, research is part of, uh, of our work, but not really uh, the most that we do. And uh, the teaching methods, of course, uh, you know, are slowly uh, evolving to become uh, digit digitized and uh, and interdisciplinary, but they were moving at the normal pace any national university would have. Now, uh, what uh, this uh, committee did, uh, or you know, this uh, this uh, crisis team was able to do, is to speed up the process and uh, within one week be able to deliver uh, teaching online. Now, this is the good news. Of course, when you switch uh, so quickly uh, to um, a new setup and a new way of uh, delivering. Uh, you face some issues, and I will try to like walk you through those very quickly and uh, answer your questions later on uh, so that we allow time for uh, uh, some discussion. So uh, the points of strength of the work that we are doing, again, we are realistic. You know, we know that we have, we are very uh, lucky to be in a, in a setup like Qatar. It's a rich country. It's a country that invests its richness in uh, uh, its capacities. It's not like, uh, you know, uh, a rich country with uh, money in, in, in banks or investments abroad. Uh, the money that uh, that is generated is used for, anyways, for the needs of the society. Uh, uh, like 2% of the budget uh, is, uh, of the total budget of the government is for educational needs. And this is a very big budget, I can tell you. So uh, we had all the necessary platforms uh, for the in terms of technology. Uh, we have uh, high-speed internet, we have um, all the hardware, software, whatever you might think of was available in terms of, uh, you know, uh, needs at the country level. Of course, that was, uh, again, the case for Qatar University, who had a very uh, strong ITC infrastructure uh, that enabled it to move very fast on, uh, you know, making a decision and the delivering. Uh, we are. We were also able, as I told you, you know, the pandemic started here in March 2020. Uh, we had also benefited from a, lo a lot from our uh, international partnerships, and that was the role that was tasked to us as international office uh, during this pandemic, is to see how our partners reacted, because you know, in the beginning, everybody was questioning or uh, you know asking questions about how can we do that. Uh, so we received a lot of help, especially from East Asia, uh, from the Far East, in fact, China. Our partner, Peking University, was the first one to respond to our needs. And Peking University has been involved uh, both in terms of uh, course delivery, but also in terms of inter intervention of its medical teams uh, on the ground, especially in Wuhan. So they were able to share with us their experience firsthand. And uh, we, we were able to understand at least what are the, you know, what is this, uh, this uh, virus? Uh, how does it, how can we prevent it from uh, uh, spreading? And uh, these first uh, 
instructions about uh, how to tackle the, uh, the, the the virus in terms of uh, you know uh, all the uh, sanitization and all these things were given to us by, by our international partners. And uh, again, also similarly, Italians were very useful, University of Bologna, uh, Milano, because they also had gone through a very traumatic uh, experience, but uh, different from the Chinese, but also very useful to us. And they were able to help us through this. So basically, it's the, you know, the two main points until now are, as I told you, the uh, uh, point of strength was mainly the fact that, you know, we have the infrastructure. Some other universities, other parts of the world did not have that. And we had very reliable partners who were able to help us and to respond to us. Uh, of course, as I told you, the strategy itself had put in place um, uh, some key performance indicators for uh, the digitization. So we were not really surprised. We did not have to uh, deal with something we did not work. So some committees were already working on uh, KPIs related to digitization. Uh, we had also uh, some uh, key partners in town who knew uh, our needs and were starting to work with us. So again, we built on this. Um, the uh, Again, uh, all this enabled us to uh, have a very quick first run uh, on uh, how are we doing, how are we faring on these key performance indicators in terms of um, our strategy, and to be able to adjust very quickly, reprioritize, of course, this became a priority. Uh, we reprioritized and we were also able to adjust um, a major number of key performance indi indicators. Now, the uh, key issues we have faced are basically, you know, different from uh, what other universities around us in the region, but also uh, in the world uh, knew. We, we came to know this uh, through our involvement, as Paula mentioned, with the International Association of Universities that very quickly uh, ran a survey uh, worldwide to see how we responded. And uh, you know, collected data regionally uh, from uh, institutions about uh, how uh, people responded. We were able to see that we were fortunate not to have the same uh, issues. Of course, we had very similar issues to other universities, but they were only limited to that. We, we did not have to worry about our students not having laptops, uh, not having access to internet at home, uh, having to access uh, the courses through uh, their phones instead of having a, a natural setting. You know, th these were all available to our students. What we have faced, of course, is that our pedagogies and uh, the methods of teaching, what I mean by that is the methods of teaching, especially evaluation methods, were not adapted to this kind of changes. Uh, teachers would be able to teach, of course, uh, online. Uh, with some training, but uh, as far as coming to evaluation, we had faced a lot of issues, um, some of which are, of course, based on integrity, you know, are these students doing their own tests or not, but others are also dealing with, uh, you know, the logistics of the test. Uh, we had, uh, again, uh, this team uh, that was working on the crisis management team was able to organize with the academic sector uh, faculty and students um, uh, training for both online uh, teaching and uh, you know uh, and uh, evaluation uh, so uh, we were able to uh, directly move to uh, uh, in one week as i said to something uh, at least you know a minimum of possibilities of delivery of the content uh, we are we are also one of the key issues we faced also was that uh, we had different uh, knowledge of technology between faculty and students some were very advanced some were less advanced so that would tell you that some courses went uh, ahead very quickly and moved fast while others were struggling. Again, that was a, a major source of disturbance according to the students when we did the survey to find out what were the things that they had faced with, uh, you know, they, they were facing. Uh, now, um, uh, after that, we had to start facing the uh, new challenges of the new normal, uh, for, especially for courses that, are, uh, that contain a lab component or that contain clinical uh, matters because suddenly our medical students were not able to go to uh, hospitals anymore because if you remember the first uh, part of the pandemic, uh, they only wanted qualified personnel and really you know, well-trained personnel to deal with the pandemic and with the uh, patients because they did not want to take any risks on, the, on the, our medical students and on the patient themselves. Uh, so we had to face these things in terms of pedagogy. How do we uh, replace labs and uh, experiential uh, learning with uh, online uh, learning? And of course, the second thing is the changes around campus, the new architecture of the campus based on the uh, uh, 
social distancing based on the uh, temperature check, sanitizing, that also affected a big part of the budget. Uh, of course, as I told you, we, ha we are fortunate to be in Qatar. We're, uh, you know, it's a wealthy country that is investing a lot, but at the same time, it's also suffering from the worldwide uh, uh, economic crisis. So we still have a lot with respect to others, but we have less than, uh, you know, being able to say, okay, we can guess and check and try. And if we don't do well, we will have to, we will have the budget to correct our mistakes. No, now we have to be able to, uh, you know, rebudget and uh, have some good, fa you know, facilities management so that we don't fall into, um, um, uh, you know, a, a budget crisis again. Finally, I, you know, the, I would like to share with you what are like uh, final thoughts, like first final thoughts, of course, of this, uh, these six months we have spent. Uh, there will be others. There will be also, um, uh, we will have to uh, revisit those, I'm sure. But until now, I can say that we have definitely our, uh, uh, you know, teaching model will definitely be shifting to hybrid. Uh, and I'm, I'm not saying now, now we're doing a hybrid, but I'm saying, you know, on the long run, uh, we don't see the online component vanishing at any point. Uh, there were very good success stories that we can build on and others we cannot continue in, in uh, online. So even when we are back to the new normal, hopefully when this uh, thing is over, uh, the changes that happened due, uh, due to COVID are uh, everlasting. Of course, that will uh, impact the student mobility and the faculty mobility. And we are, you know, uh, working with the local governments on policies for that. I'm talking about visas. I'm talking about, you know, um, uh, length of stay. All of these are being taken care of now. Uh, the state of Qatar, as I told you before, is also engaged worldwide on uh, eradicating. Uh, in fact, you know, they, they have a very big initiative with the United Nations uh, Education for All that is anyways ongoing. Of course, this education for all uh, uh, that give, provides tries to provide pro opportunities for children worldwide to study, at least have access to basic education, um, is uh, uh, now uh, leaning more towards the uh, new normal and the online learning, especially in, uh, in, in, in areas of the world where they, where, uh, they don't have access to internet and stuff like that. At the same time, Qatar University being a national institution will definitely have to follow through in this, and we are uh, very much eager to finish from our own problems with online learning and try to help and uh, make our partners benefit from our experience, just like we benefited from the experience of uh, our own partners. And this is very important on the internationalization uh, setup. This is one of the things that internationalization can be proud of during this pandemic. Of course, we've lost a lot of uh, points of strength as, uh, in internationalization, but uh, this one was a really very strong point, which is the collaboration of the institutions on uh, fighting the pandemic. And um, finally, uh, COVID-19 has, of course, got an enduring impact. We know that uh, it will be a generational shift and uh, we have to um, adapt to the new normal in education also, which is that the delivery of teaching is changing and this change is irreversible. We cannot teach the kids anymore, the kids at school, students at universities uh, in the same way that we used to do before the pandemic. And thank you very much. And I hope that uh, this was, uh, you know, um, gave you a, an idea of the general context and I'll be happy to answer any questions later on. Thank you. So thank you. Uh, right now, uh, Francisco is going to incorporate to our panel. Uh, Hello, everyone. Right, mm -hmm. our panel. Hello. My apologies for the delay. We have we experienced some problem with internet due to heavy rainfall and thunderstorm. <laughs> That's the problem of <laughs> virtual seminars and virtual life. But thanks God, now is everything okay. Well, again, uh, sorry for the delay. I was listening carefully to Cesar was saying and take some note, but perhaps we could debate afterwards once our, our colleague uh, express or explain their point of view. And then afterwards we will start uh, the debate, the discussion. So we further do uh, either Andres or Santiago, as you prefer. Now, please take the podium.
Okay, so I'm I'm gonna go first. My my part it's a bit more um, setting the scene, and I think Andres will have some really interesting words to tell us about his uh, personal experience as a student, as a and, a, and as an assistant professor. Um, I will now share the the presentation I made. There you go. There, there you go. Can can everyone see it? Perfect. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead, please. So, so here I'm going to talk about uh, digital transition in education. What what the process is about. What is the digital transition? And several pointers uh, and. And information I think will be very useful, especially when we talk about the 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 transition that COVID has has forced upon us. Um, so first of all, there are a lot of organizations that have different um, intentions with regards to the digital transition in education. I, I would like to share a, a very brief anecdote. When I was in in junior high, I was sent by my school and by the Mexican government to uh, the Convention for International Society for Technology in Education. And there uh, we were supposed to, to present a government project in cartography. But what really interested me is that um, as I toured the convention, I saw that the, the technology in education meant more than creating new, new ways to teach, just enhancing the, the already existing learning techniques. So, so I found that very interesting um, from, from digital blackboards to tablets to just uh, uh, laser pointers to give to the teachers. Uh, I, I thought that was very interesting the way that around 10 years ago, we, we saw the, the digital or the technological transformation in education, not as a way to change the way we teach or the way we learn, but just a, a way to enhance it. And now as more and more technologies come up and as uh, the, the, the worldwide landscape changes, I think we're forced to accept other ways in which we can, well, really experience our learning, our la learning, um, yes, the, the, the way we learn and the way we teach. So when I, when I mention the digital transition in education, I'm not talking about a, a straightforward immediate change. It's not you go from uh, classrooms, from blackboards, from teachers in, in those classrooms to a full digitalized uh, personalized, personalized experience. Th there is what I, what I call the digital assisted technologies and those are a bit of the technological experience with a bit of the analog experience. Uh, instead of blackboards, you would have electronic ba backboards. Instead of tablets, you, instead of desks, you would have tablets. And then you can talk about a digital, a completely digital education, video conferencing, home studying, a, 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 an actual change of the way we we do our teaching. So, what what is really important is. Even, even when we go to a full uh, digital education, it's, it's not clear if we should completely uh, eliminate all traditional forms of schooling. They're there for a reason and they have their, their obvious uses. And uh, most, most analysts think that a balance is in need instead of just a complete digital transition. Okay. We also have, if we think about the, the digital transition, we have to think about the technology as a subject or technology as a tool. Technology and its relationship to education is twofold. First of all, technology can be a subject in school. You can have courses with specific, uh, specific um, elements of, of technology. You can have coding classes. Um, you can have classes to te teach how to use Excel, how to teach, uh, how to use Microsoft Word, or many many of the Google Suite applications. You can teach your your children how to your students how to do the um, use the marketing applications. 
for example, uh, Google Analytics, how to use Facebook to, to create a, a business. And also technology can be a tool. Digital blackboards, PDFs, but also video conferencing. The, the, the subject you're teaching is not the technology itself, but it's, it's a, a tool you can use to enhance or transform your teaching. And here I put two examples, uh, Girls Who Code and One Laptop Per Child. Girls Who Code is very interesting. It's a, a non-governmental organization dedicated to teaching specifically uh, girls and women how to program and how to ins insert them into the, the, the STEM background. And th that organization is more interested in technology as a subject, but they obviously also use technology as a tool. When they give uh, uh, the, the girls who code laptops so they can uh, learn to, to program, or when they uh, give them different programming applications, they're using technology as a tool as well. And for example, one laptop per child is focused on technology as a tool. They give uh, laptops to children in, in disadvantaged areas, but they also give uh, um, they also give small courses in the way to use those laptops. So even if you have an organization dedicated principally in uh, uh, mainly in technology as a tool, you can also have a bit of overlap with technology as a subject. Another very important element is that education goals guide the methods. As I mentioned before, we have a lot of non-governmental organizations that are dedicated to, um, to, to do the, the digital transition or to promote the digital transition. But there are also other institutions that are interested in this process. We have um, uh, private institutions, we have uh, businesses that, that are dedicated towards bringing about this change. Uh, for example, uh, Google is a very well-known um, organization, well, uh, enterprise that really takes care of certain elements of the digital transition but governments are also interested in in pursuing this the digital transition for many reasons and the reasons they pursue the, the digital transition for really illustrate the way they are the, the, they are going to 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 do this for example you have enhancing the educational experience or making teachers more efficient and beneficial to the students. You have um, tailoring the education to our student needs. The, this focus on the student, the, the, this makes the course specifically for the student so each student can learn as much as possible. You can also have uh, uh, as a goal, the, the, the expansion and reach of educational institutions. If you're, if you're a business, if you're a school that wants to have even more students, then you can use digital, um, digital technologies to expand your reach. Now, if you're a university like uh, Harvard, uh, London School of Economics, you, you can use tools like Coursera or, or other online courses to span the number of, of, of students and also expand your, uh, expand your income. And also specifically for, for the governments, the standardization of education is very important, is no matter where in my country, I want people who graduated from high school, from junior high, from certain colleges, I want them to know all of these things. I want to be able to pick everyone out of a, of a junior high no matter the, the place. And I want them to know A, B, C. I want them to know math. I want them to uh, know how to use computers. So that's, that's really important as a government. Um, one of the, the main goals for, for the government using the digital technologies is precisely the standardizing of education. So, the, the, the path of education is very important. Here I'm going to, to explain it in the broadest possible sense so that, that we can really understand the role technology has in, in, the, in the process of the education. Stu the student 
either either if you're um very young or you're older what you want to is acquire knowledge that that's the final goal and knowledge can take many forms it can take uh, uh the form of skills of abilities of uh even networking but they want to acquire knowledge but the thing they have in front of them is not knowledge it's information and the real uh challenge is transforming the the not the information into knowledge so the information technology acts as a gate right now and more than ever in 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 our life we have access to millions and millions of gigabytes of information however what we do with with, with those uh gigabytes of information really depends on the education system are we being guided throughout this um, sea of information towards creating skills and acquiring actual knowledge. And that's really the, the question we have to, to make. Because we have seen, seen in, the, in the recent years that there are very big changes in higher education. Um, I, I am sharing to you the, these notes. They, they are very dramatic, obviously, but um, every every now and then, if you if you want to study in, in a college in a university, you're you're confronted with these um, th these uh, newsletters that say uh, the, the the degree is dead and half in in U.S. now consider college education very important. It's it's scary for the students. And why is that? What why we are, are we now uh, doubting the value of the degree? It's because um, for about 400 years since uh, the, the creation of schools like, like uh, La Sorbonne in Paris, of, of Harvard, of Yale, we have had in place a four-year uh, college degree. And it has changed very little. The, 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 the way we learn hasn't really been transformed. It has it, it, it has been slightly modified in certain ways, obviously, and there are um, ways we have learned to, to, to teach uh, in a slightly different ways, but it, has really, it hasn't really changed. And we are now asking of our professionals, of our students, way more than we were asking 100 years ago. But each profession has become highly specialized with very specific uh, uh, knowledge requirements and knowledge demands that our higher education has now be, uh, become obsolete to, to cover. So what, what we're doing right now is uh, pushing our students to, to do masters or, or doctorate uh, degrees to acquire professions that, that uh, uh, just a four-year college would have been enough 100 years ago. And one of the reasons is that because the demand of knowledge has increased exponentially but the way we learn hasn't really increased. It's it, that, that that's where the deficiency um, resides. So I, I, I really like this uh, this phrase: new demands and knowledge require the transformation of the educational system with digital information technologies. But as a tool, another final objective. The problem with many of the policies is that it ends with the student acquiring a laptop. And that's not enough. It ends with the student uh, acquiring uh, Google Meet, acquiring Zoom to, to have the, the education on a video conference. But that's not enough. You need to really think about transforming the way we teach. We need to use the, the, the digital transition tools to really uh, change the way we learn and, and use the things that are already there. We have now a world with millions of educational videos that may be tailored to, to very specific ways of learning, and we need to use them. In that case, we, we end up talking about the difference between additive technologies and transformative technologies. Additive technologies just enhance, but then multiply the, the, the amount of knowledge you learn. Digital blackboards, uh, uh, video conferencing, those are additives. They, they really do help. 
But what we need is a transformative uh, approach towards education, access to new types of teaching, different course formats, uh, really tailoring education towards the student. And but you, you cannot ignore the role of the teacher. You're not going to leave the, the, the student to navigate on it on his own, his or her own, the, the, the world of information. They need a guide and the teacher has to transform being the only gate to knowledge to a guide through knowledge. And finally, and I think we will talk about this more uh, um, with, with Andres, there are external forces that impact the transition. There are things that will slow this transition or that will uh, make it faster. Natural dis disasters that destroy uh, uh, Wi-Fi connections, that destroy uh, en uh, electricity um, connections, well, it, it, it really hampers the process of digital, tra digital transformation. But for example, uh, the pandemic right now, that in other cases will ha wreaks havoc on the economy, it, it right now forces us to consider another uh, another way of teaching. So that 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 would be all for me right now. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, very interesting, uh, if I might say also provocative in a good sense. So we could have a intense debate afterwards. I also took some note that I think there are some connection with things that have been already discussed and perhaps some others that will be discussed now by, by Andres. So perhaps now Paola want to uh, introduce Andres. So uh, Andres is also a collaborate, uh, a member of the Observatory of Relation between US and Mexico, um, directed by Mariana, who is right, she is right now uh, in the forum. So I'm more than welcome you, Andres, and we will listen to you. Thank you very much. Uh, hello to everybody. I will now share screen. Um, the presentation. Okay. Um, first of all, um, I would like to, to thank the organizing institutions of this webinar towards the Global University 2030 and the Center of Research of, on North America of the National Autonomous University of Mexico, the University of Salamanca, the University of Extremadura, and Qatar University for extending me the invitation to participate in this webinar. Um, in this presentation, I will present the actual panorama of the National Autonomous University of Mexico, university in which I study, and the challenges it faces. The, these challenges have been catalyzed by the actual global emergency that COVID-19 pandemic has represented, and they have shown rapidly in the way we understand education. Um, despite the, the short period in which the pandemic has presented itself with respect to the considerations it mean to the um, um, yeah, the, the considerations. Um, sorry, just one moment. Yeah, yeah sorry. Um, the, yeah, these considerations, uh, what, what they mean to, to the organization of education, such as the as studies plans, for example, we already have some preliminary results that let us see a, a, a glimpse of the areas of opportunity that digital education provides in face of the actual sanitary crisis, as well as the approach we have of, of education itself in a near future. Um, to get us in context, I would like to present a couple of facts about the Faculty of Political and Social Sciences at the National Autonomous University of Mexico. Um, the Political Science Faculty is one of the many centralized and decentralized faculties and study centers of the university. According to um, the last published official results, uh, official data, sorry, um, of, uh, of, the, of the university, uh, the faculty has approximately 6,885 students, all coming from the bachelor's degrees from anthropology, communication sciences, political science and public administration, um, international relations and sociology. 
these uh, numbers only considering the bachelor's uh, programs uh, and letting aside the students for postgraduate degree programs. Uh, to put this into perspective with, with uh, the, the whole university, um, UNAM has now um, a total of 360,883 uh, students uh, from high school to postgraduate programs. This number represents a, a student population larger than the population of cities like Utrecht in the Netherlands, Bilbao in Spain, or Nice in France. Um, UNAM is nowadays the largest university in Latin America and one of the largest 25 universities in the world. Having into consideration the already presented data, um, UNAM can be considered as a mega university. This, of course, represents unique opportunities and challenges of its own kind. Now, um, UNAM has a, a budget around uh, $2.2 billion annually, uh, coming primarily from the federal government budget. More than half of this, uh, of this budget goes to the salaries of academics and professors, and one fourth, uh, one fourth part of this, um, this budget is invert, invert, in, inverted, yeah, inverted in research. This budget, uh, compared to other universities, is very limited to the, um, in, in, consideration, in consideration of the, uh, of the great academic community UNAM has. Um, it, this budget does not allow UNAM to have this lack of monetary resources to respond to crises of the nature of the actual pandemic, for example. Other aspects to consider are the objectives of the, of the university. Historically, UNAM has been considered as the University of Mexico and has also been con a cornerstone of Mexican political educational system. Since UNAM is a public university, its main objective has been the formation of professionals that serve the interests and necessities of the nation. This means that UNAM represents on one hand, the opportunity for thousands or millions of Mexicans for having a free quality higher and middle higher education. Uh, and under the other, that responsibility, the, the responsibility that uh, universities, the students of the university have with the Mexican people through their professional performance. And uh, this means to give back to the people that has invested on them, that has invested to the, in, in their education, the, um, the work that they have, um, the opportunity that they have to, to, to study uh, in the university. Um, studying during the pandemic has represented an enormous amount of efforts that would otherwise not have been done. The um, sudden change, uh, uh, the sudden character of uh, sanitary measures provoked that uh, from one day to another, thousands of professors and, uh, and students had the necessity of translating their presential classes to online classes. Many of us have never had this necessity. Uh, and these obliged professors and students to look for communication channels to answer the question on how we would take our classes. The response of the political science faculty was very bright. Of course, the fact that the semester has already begun in many of the faculties and especially in, in, in political science faculty allowed a communication channel uh, more immediate among professors and students. Nevertheless, the response depended a lot on professors. For, for a lot of uh, oldest professors, it meant a huge, huge challenge in comparison to younger professors and, and also their the younger, younger students. And certainly a lot of professors made a huge effort to look for means and digital platforms that, that, that best serve the purposes of their classes. Um, nevertheless, for others, making this transition was extremely, extremely difficult. So another response was simply not to give online classes and to assign reading materials so um, then writing assignments could be delivered. Um, the diversity of responses, uh, not all of them positive, of course, was possible by the academic freedom that UNAM professors have. This uh, initial moment of the uh, migration from, from procession classes, presential classes to online classes lays on the table the first challenge in the pandemic that is institutional cooperation and coordination. Now, um, the, use, uh, the particularities of online classes obliged professors and students to search among the broad offer of platforms and applications that could resolve the necessities of each class. Certainly there are platforms that were easier to use and other that made classwork much more difficult. Um, nevertheless, uh, this implied an accelerated and immediate process of, of crash course into to know how this platform uh, this, this platforms uh, work 
and how to use them for the for the materials that, that we already had in, in our presential classes, both for professors and for students. Um, that now we're being forced to understand uh, an educational platform that previously uh, we had barely used, or maybe they, we, we haven't used at all, or maybe even, even we know that existed. This uh, transition also showed the importance of, of databases of academic content, the content, sorry, the, the impossibility of accessing the bibliographic collections of the university made professors and students on the, um, to, to search for the material that we, that we needed for our classes. This meant, of course, that um, to, to understand, uh, to, to get to know the databases that we had at the university and to understand how these databases worked. Uh, for most of the classes, we also had the problem that uh, these, da these databases don't, uh, didn't have the material that we, that we looked for. So it uh, made us, in, in, on the one hand, to look for the, to, to digitalize the material that we had on physical, uh, that meant books and magazines and other sort of materials that we, we, we use in our presential classes. And on the other hand, meant that uh, we needed to change uh, the program of the class so it can uh, adapt and um, responds better to the materials that, 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 we, that we do have. And um, it also meant uh, this redesigning of the courses that we uh, get to know our students and our teachers. Um, it was very important for us to, to know the, the, the context in which the students were studying uh, from, from, their, from their homes, from their, uh, from, from the, from, from the per places that they were in, in the lockdown. So uh, we can understand how, uh, where, what were the means of, um, that they had to, to address the, 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 classes, the classes themselves. So um, redesigning the classes uh, obliged the teachers and, and professors to know them, uh, to know them more. This necessity of getting in contact via the institutional um, the mail or uh, non-institutional channels such as Facebook and WhatsApp and, and, and other applications of the sort and to design an academic program uh, completely online allowed uh, on the one hand to uh, students to understand the complications that professors had to design in such um, work plans and on the other it made us teachers to uh, understand and, um, and to know the context in which students study. Um, in this way, uh, classes that uh, some months ago were understood uh, under a, a public sphere because students and professors shared a public a common space, uh, this meant of the classrooms in the university. Now uh, we had uh, um, this private sphere in which uh, professors and students um, had the, the, the necessity to, to, to transition to um, to make it available to, uh, to take their classes. It meant that um, we could see the, the space, the private space in which students and professors assisted to classes, such in the necessity as uh, knowing the personal context that it could make easier or more difficult their education. This of course uh, takes us to the technological limitations. Uh, and this is the last point of the presentation. We had to know the personal, uh, context of professors and students uh, and their capacity to attend their classes. It also let us see a glimpse of the difficulties of the technological difficulties on which they face. Uh, this pandemic has also allowed us to understand that there are a lot of students and professors that do not um, have access to the technology necessary to take the class. Uh, with this, I refer that uh, they even don't count with a computer, a tablet or a cell phone uh, from which they can take an, an online class, such as the materials that they, uh, they can use or they should use to take their classes, uh, and as well as the availability that they could have if they had this, these devices in their homes. Um, in a lot of cases, the computers or tablets that they could use for the, for the classes were uh, shared material that they have with, uh, with the rest of their family. Uh, in, and in this way, um, these devices were uh, at the same time, um, uh, academic centers, professional centers, and personal centers for, for the life that we uh, had before the pandemic outside of our, of our, of our, of our houses. Um, 
Another aspect into, to take into consideration that already Santiago had mentioned is the connection to a wire, uh, to, to internet connection. Um, was it a wireless network or a mobile network coverage? Um, this problem uh, was, uh, um, it was a main problem for all of us who were taking these classes from professors that sometimes didn't have a, um, a very good connection to the internet so they can take these kind of, uh, of, of presential classes through a, a, a video call. And also to um, some of our students that come not uh, particularly from the, the heart of Mexico City that uh, has in a, in a broad way a, a very good uh, connection to the, to the internet, but also from communities that uh, do not have internet at all. So uh, it forced us to understand uh, how can we make available the, ed the education that we have uh, in presential classes available to students that uh, didn't have the means to take in these classes. Um, into, um, these particularities uh, have as well, the, uh, uh, were uh, intimately related with the develop economic development that uh, we can see in, uh, in, in different nations. Uh, mean, uh, as uh, some, so some of these, sorry, some, some of these educational, uh, digital education tools can be available in, in a greater measure in developed countries, of course, and uh, in less developed countries, these, uh, these measures are in, in some cases completely unavailable. And these are uh, things that we had into consideration to design in some of the classes that, um, that we have at UNAM. To get us this into perspective, for example, in Mexico, we have three of the main uh, companies that provide internet and wireless internet services such as Telcel or America Mobile in, in other countries. Uh, and these maps show the coverage of, um, of, of mobile network, um, net, of the mobile network and the intensity of the download of these networks. Uh, Telcel is the one that has the, the biggest network in Mexico and um, you can see as well that our, there are uh, a lot of regions that don't have internet, internet connection at all. Um, for example, taking into consideration the, the, the network from uh, AT&T or Unifon, uh, you can see that the, the network is uh, a lot, lot shorter and uh, the download uh, speed is also shorter uh, in, in comparison with these two companies. Um, and the third company is Movistar that, uh, our, that our Spanish fellow, fellas may, may know as uh, Telefonica. Uh, that is the, the third biggest uh, uh, network in Mexico. And, and, uh, and as you can see, it doesn't have the, as much coverage as uh, AT&T or, or the, uh, Telcel. So um, to close our, uh, my presentation, there are two main questions that we may, may, might make ourselves uh, from the experiences that we have had in this pandemic. The first of all is, which changes will we embrace? What, uh, what things have we made different and may uh, be useful to, to, the, to the creating uh, of education from, from the years to come? And um, is this the, the beginning of a new paradigm in education? Uh, from our experience, uh, it, it has made us think differently uh, on how we programmed our courses to, uh, to think which um, means are available to the students, uh, what kind of material they can have, and also to think um, we should have better material to access for uh, not only the, the people on our university, but to the people in general, to have access to digital resources that we uh, difficultly have uh, is, is a, a very uh, important objective that we could pursue as such as a, a, an academic institution and to have a cooperation between different academic institutions and of course with different governments. Um, that would be all for my part. I, I will be very grateful to have also your your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Andres. Uh, also very interesting uh, explanation, very interesting talk. And well, afterwards we will we we'll launch the debate. But first, uh, I will give the podium to, to Paola Suarez.
So thank you, everyone. Uh, I will continue some of the talks of uh, Santiago and Andres about our reality here in Mexico, about the, the global education and the main goals right now in the COVID-19 pandemic. So I will share with you, with you my presentation. So just let me move a little bit because I can see it on my screen. So yeah, as, as we discussed before, uh, since 1999, the mega universities are defined by new models in the world to organize the knowledge economy. The universities are presented as centers of development and also as a social and educa edu educational organizations that changed a lot during the last decade of the 20th century. So in this time, at, after COVID-19, we are concentrated on how to create better environments and better public policies to sustaining our growth of productivity and to ensure the expanding of our higher education institutes and systems. As we know, the creative capitalism endorsed new technologies and medias to support the development of the knowledge economy based on the quality, equity, and also the self-governance or autonomy of the universities. This elements as a response of a global economy. The third globalization observed for some of theories as a dilemma in which policymakers who fully uh, believe in market economics are rethinking how we can optimize it and getting out of the market to get self-confidence of our institutions and also to the higher education systems all, all the world. As a dialectic system, as you know, the mega universities express a new deal with the digital education. Some of the aspects that my last, uh, that my colleagues mentioned in the last participations, you can observe as a new capacity to model flexibility, for example, in the curricula, teaching methods, and a new sense of academic community that probably or we are thinking is disappearing or is in 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 a in, in crisis also as a, a higher education institutions um, in this context i will express that digital education is a concept to refer to a new teaching models as uh, we re review in the other presentation based on learning that it's accompanied by technology or by instru instructional practices that makes effective the use of technology. Um, it can encompass also the application of a wide spectrum of practices, including, for example, blended and virtual learning. And the purpose of this uh, talk is to understanding how universities are better to use these new technologies. So I started, I just discussed three points, the third globalization as a context, the second is the mega universities, and the third is the dig digital education. So I will be, um, I will start as a big uh, a view of the third globalization is uh, in, in the context of the higher education, we can see a new market with the creation of new systems of universities uh, that supplanted the historic and traditional mega universities as National University of Mexico, of course, and other universities that were, and also could be the, the University of Salamanca, that are, they have uh, traditional models that are coming from the uh, colonial and also from uh, other Context, historical context. Some of these models that have impacted higher education science since the 1990s are the following. We have new models right now. Uh, extended traditional universities as National University of Mexico, the, the profit adult centered universities, distance education technology based universities, corporate universities, university industry, 
strategic alliances and degree certification competency based university. These new kind of universities made a different competition in our arena and in the competition for new and better spaces for higher education. Mega universities as UNAM and now massive open universities as uh, other models like technology, Tecnológico in Monterrey in Mexico have created unique systems to compete with their peers with the provision of full time to, to teach, for design their programs and curriculum. While another platforms such as Coursera and Google Academic that contain a myriad of courses and research data. So the creation of this platform as Coursera in, in the last years and the renovation of new models, hybrid models with the universities serve as models also for the universities to promote new technologies and communication spaces for the new challenge of digital education in the COVID times at the universities that they have their own systems. We have the creation also of new platforms uh, with uh, the help of these platforms uh, as Coursera that currently serve to develop our courses, of course, and cl in classrooms and seminars as we are uh, sharing right now, a seminar in, in Zoom. There have been many changes from everyday life for the development for, of universities and mega universities, such as groups of universities that have a global projection that have a high number of students. And also we offer as mega universities a large number of programs. We were designed since the middle of the last century and transformed at the end of the 20th century to reach the consumption of a great project of digital education. And I noticed that this is a process of crisis of the universities in the present pandemic. If in the 1990s, it was an idea and also an utopia. Right now we are, have the model and we have this model as a crisis. The third globalization also criticizes as a model in, in, in crisis has led different organizations such as universities to re reboil themselves in a world disconnected between the economic and the social, where the logic of the market seems to snatch the first uh, fruits of the needs and absorb the greatest capital to account for a vital global economy. Universities in this way seek to, un to understanding of this market logic with the introduction of new technologies that allow us to continue to communicate low, uh, knowledge. So I'm going to start to discuss more about these mega universities. So the mega universities since 1990s have the objective of preserving a best, uh, the best technology strategies in order to improve educational systems as uh, we noticed in the, in, I, I can uh, relate this with a, with a map that, uh, Andres uh, Santiago give us in her in his presentation that is not the same the the inter, the relation of the is the spaces of communication or information and the necessity of, or the need to construct the educational system so really the educational system is the is the only way that we have to include our strategies to uh, understand and also to study the new digital spaces. So mega universities must compete to remain sustainable and for quality to help them maintain the organizations of their demands and challenge, such as um, could be economy of scale, discipline, control, and also another demands as the competition in wide spaces of economic regions as North America. And value, of course, in all this uh, economic competition, it's important to discuss the, val the value chains or the thing, the changing of uh, the values of the economy trapped by the productivity and the universities, of course, are one of the sectors more important based on macroeconomic models that always advocate 
for surveillance or for uh, and for a better competition. Um, so all these, uh, well, all this panorama of mega universities is uh, is difficult in the region of North America. So we can see that the crisis of the mega universities is still there. Even before of the COVID-19, we have a big crisis for first for uh, sustainability or auto sustainability of their own universities. So they don't have enough money to support the projects here in the area of, of, of here in the region of North, North America. Uh, Cesar uh, tell us about the experience of Qatar and they have a more a budget for the universities, but in our region, they, and, and more, more in Mexico, we, we don't have a lot of, of budget to support the public, uh, the public education. So the next point is just uh, some reflection about the digital education in this context of inequality. So I, we have that the digital education began with a revolution of the of uh, a digital revolution. As a revolution, uh, we know that the revolution implies change without return, as histor in a perspective uh, historical view. So we can turn again with uh, to the nineties, or we can turn again to the twenties. Uh, so we need to start to thinking about our, our main spaces. So computers, of course, came to stay here from 1970s with uh, the development of a lot of uh, um, a lot of connectivity, and also arrives with a new era of development of the internet, smartphones, and PCs in the last decade. However, in this point of view, we need to think uh, about uh, th that this, if this period of change will help us to observe not just an advance or, a, or like uh, evolution, also if we can observe the adaptation of new spaces of education in, in, in our realities, and also how these uh, technologies are visible in an uh, infra, in, uh, infrastructure that we have in the universities for the development. So the digital is observed here as a phenomenon that uh, could be divided, the social and economical spheres. Digital education, of, of course, express opportunities that as research teams in the universities we discuss, but also we need to discuss this as a research process as uh, community, uh, as university communities. So the question also could be asked uh, about how, how these crises are resolved in our context right now. And if we have uh, enough experience or an ability to expand these spaces for coexistence and regulate also the reality of the digital education. Uh, if we have also the self capacity to understand uh, the mass communication in this re renovated arena of the COVID. And finally, in the UNAM, we have uh, uh, new models and research, educa uh, educational research that allows to coordinate new efforts for training processes. Um, one of the main projects is uh, one of uh, is a new center that it's operated uh, since, uh, I think since August this year, as a response of uh, the, the pandemic. Uh, the, uh, this new center is, the name is the Coordination of Open University Educational Innovation and Distance Education that represent for the UNAM and National University, the UNAM effort to strengthen our educational development, curricular innovation, educational evaluation, and open education. So my experience in this, uh, in this, uh, in this field is uh, important to, uh, to discuss and uh, remain some elements that we need as a teacher and also we need uh, to share with the students. So one of the main ideas of this forum is to share experience also with the students. So for
for that, this forum is uh, related not just between academics, also with all the students to discuss new elements. So of course, we don't have time right now to, to discuss all these elements, but some ideas that we are continuing in our forum. So um, really, we have the choice of appropriate these technologies technolo to, if we have really the choice of appropriate these technologies for education or is an imposition. So we have access to technology, but of course we, we have the inequality of this. How, what kind of costs are uh, in this, in, in this uh, process and the infrastructure if is, is functional for our university and also for our country. So we can see on the map that Andres shared with us that we have a different infrastructure and also uh, there are these disparities between the geography in Mexico. So we have more concentration in the center and in the south and the north in the north borders. We don't have enough infrastructure. So we have also and there are ways to acknowledge and learning processes in new educational environments. So my three last points are about if uh, we have enough points of interactivity or are not enough regulated, if there implies new organizational matters, it's important the speed and the novelty and innovation to adjust in this digital education. So my conclusion is that, or my final thoughts are the, if we have the dissemination of the knowledge of this uh, research in, about our, organ, our universities, not as organizations, more than uh, places that we can take these decisions and we can develop new actions to support and improve our education, based not just on the regulation of the market, but also about and uh, about also related with the necessities of our own societies. So the creation of these universities communities as this forum support critical capacities for our decision ma making that we can continue as this uh, in this forum that uh, I'm pleased to coordinate with Francisco. So thank you so much for your attention. And uh, so we can continue to our panel. Thank you very much, um, Paola. Can you hear me? Yeah. OK, sorry. Uh, well, um, now we will open the, the debate. And, in order to do so, if you agree, I will comment briefly, very briefly, a few some ideas of each of the paper, each of the presentation, and then we'll try, try to trace some comparison. As I said before, as far as I was listening to you and taking notes, there were some point of connection in between you guys. So I will just mention a few ideas uh, per, each, per each of the of the papers and then i will come out with this kind of joint point as i wrote here joint point of uh, your talks and i was very impressed by by cesar was uh, talk about their experience in, in qatar and especially interesting and perhaps uh, valuable for exporting that model to other university is how you cooperate with China or with uh, Italy, Bologna, uh, to tackle the, the serious uh, coronavirus crisis. And in that sense, my thought is how a university worldwide could eventually become their own actor in, in, in this case, in, in health issues, sometimes together with the state, the respective state, and sometimes by their own means. So. I'm trying to be also, uh, I already warned you, be sometimes uh, playing the devil advocate role so we can enter in a, in a enriching discussion. So in this sense, uh, I don't know how much room there is in, in Qatar, uh, in, in, the, in your case, in Qatar University case, 
uh, room to, to work uh, with other university without the, uh, if not the permission, but the direction of the government. In other words, how free are any given university to interact with other university in this globalized world. Uh, and then as for the presentation by, by Santiago, I was also very interested. Uh, especially, I think there is here a clear connection um, when you talk about a non-state actor uh, educator or non-state actor university, such as Khan Academy, or perhaps one of the, uh, the perfect model, no? Uh, a grassroots uh, idea or a private idea uh, that was uh, intended to fill a vacuum that was not covered, according to the founder of Khan University, uh, by classic university or by traditional university. And you know, this guy came out with this idea and created such a now uh, successful and innovative project. So my question for you, also playing this uh, devil advocate role, is uh, to what extent those private initiatives, those initiatives that come from the bottom of the society to fill out different vacuum, could or should interact with public institution in order to, to tackle uh, and to uh, face and to solve problems jointly, no? especially in such a, a dramatic situation such as the, the, the COVID. Uh, and then as for the presentation of Andres, Andres uh, Cuevas, um, also you now here the, 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 the issue of how the scenario have forced students Professor too, but students uh, living in sometimes remote areas with no very good connectivity to not not uh, lose uh, train, not lose track of the rhythm of the of the rest of the of the of the group, and this made me think of also some of the uh, Cesar was saying uh, comment when he was explaining their project to uh, launch a global education for all, no. Well, it's certainly hard to uh, teach for all when some of them have those serious uh, technological barrier you know, to get access to the university. And uh, now also briefly discussing uh, Paola Suarez presentation and also continuing with the devil advocate role as uh, I'm trying to play a mega university. Are really dealing, are really uh, adapting well, are really coping with the crisis better than medium or small side university? I don't know. Uh, in the case of UNAN, such a giant in terms of the, of the number of students and number of faculty. Uh, and that is my question for you, uh, Paola, and perhaps also could be connected later on with some of your other colleague uh, comment. I stop here. I don't want to talk more, and then I will uh, come back with some other comment. So, any one of you are now free to intervene. So, if, if, if Cesar want to wants to start, yes, uh, sure. Uh, thank you, thank you, everyone, for these presentations. Really, uh, it makes one feel. Uh, on the right track in some things and you know missing a lot on the other as uh, francisco said also you know, with um, uh, the limitations i will uh, start by answering your question about the freedom of uh, you know um, uh, movement if you want in the sense of internationalization um, and this also touches on other areas that are of concern of us that might be different than uh, what you have when i said that you know we don't have a lot of issues concerning budgeting uh, that and, and at the same time um, makes us have a bigger issue, which is the fact that uh, we are more responsible of the choices we make. You know, when, when you are given all these um, possibilities to make a choice on the technology that you want to use, to make a choice on the uh, direction you want to make, it's a different sort of pressure that uh, is put on you. While you might have to worry about how, uh, you know, uh, to raise money to be able to uh, reach uh, to, uh, you know, 
populations in areas that are less uh, fortunate, we have a different thing, which is decision making. And this perspective, of course, I will answer uh, many questions will arise on the other part. Uh, but uh, to answer Francisco, in terms of internationalization, uh, we do not have any uh, constraints. Uh, we do not have a lot of people we are not able to talk to. Uh, the idea is that at the same time, we don't have a strategy, you know, not, not a clear strategy on uh, who to tackle. Uh, the idea is that uh, Qatar perceives education as a soft power and uh, it likes to invest a lot in this area. And that's why this education above all uh, per initiative taken at the level of the uh, of the nation, which also matches uh, many of the things like uh, I noted also in Santiago's uh, presentation, the um, uh, one laptop per child initiative. Uh, Andres also tackled something about uh, needing to uh, reach all the people, uh, not only the students in terms of you know technology. So basically all this uh, makes it a point that Qatar is involved worldwide in a lot of uh, partnerships. In fact, on the ground of Qatar, we have Education City that I mentioned also uh, very uh, briefly in the beginning. That uh, includes like uh, top universities, uh, it's a branch campus of uh, top universities in the US, like Georgetown, Northwestern, uh, Wild Cornell, um, Texas A&M. So having these uh, American institutions and British and Canadian institutions in town, uh, needless to say, opens up a lot of freedom in terms of, uh, of uh, action and uh, interaction in terms of international collaboration. Now that the wise choice of these collaborations is what we benefited from in the um, um, uh, pandemic. Uh, the, uh, the internationalization um, partnership we have with Peking University is in fact a chair position uh, uh, that is funded by the state of Qatar, uh, the chair of, of, of Qatar for Middle East Studies in Peking University. And uh, that return on investment, if you want, was that this chairperson uh, who is, uh, you know, uh, Chinese and operating in China offered uh, to help and uh, walked us through the, uh, the process uh, at Peking University and uh, made us benefit from this at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, the University of Bologna is a different partnership, which is part of the uh, IREC, uh, a, a network that we are part of. So basically, uh, not to monopolize a lot of the time, uh, we have a lot of freedom, but you know, with this freedom comes a lot of responsibility so that uh, the, the money we use in these international collaborations and uh, uh, choice of international collaborations are really have a return on investment when, it, when needed. Okay, thank you very much, Cesar. So anyone not could follow the conversation? Yes, Santiago? Uh, thank you very much. I would like to touch on uh, some things, as I said, that I thought was really, really important. Um, sometimes, especially when we talk about uh, uh, transformation and we talk about new technologies, um, we tend to think that budget is our only limitation. And I, I really like what Cesar mentioned that um, sometimes when you have a very big budget or, or, or very little uh, budget restraints that uh, that in itself it's a really big uh, responsibility and a very big hurdle and and i think that's that, that really ties with, with with your question francisco um the the limitations are sometimes uh, on the means on 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 the budget obviously um what do i have to fund or what resources do I count on to, to do certain projects. But sometimes the limitations, especially in, in, in non-state non actors, uh, reside on the, on the objectives. What is the real reason you're pursuing a digital transition? Um, because sometimes is the digital tra transition is completely focused on the students and, and on uh, amplifying learning. But sometimes it, the, the digital transition is just a means to get uh, more money, uh, to expand your business, or, mm -hmm. or to have a, a deeper control on what the schools in your, in your country teach. Mm -hmm. And in, in, in that vein, I, I, I really like you mentioned again, uh, Khan Academy, mm -hmm. because uh, when, when I was studying in junior high, I really had uh, trouble with, with math. And 
Khan Academy had just started. And I remember very, very distinctly that when in Mexico, the swine flu epidemic uh, um, went to a head, we also had to institute a, a quarantine. We also had to uh, uh, go to our houses and stop going to school. I remember that my, my parents uh, didn't let me stop stu studying. And instead of going to school, I would have to use Khan Academy. And I, and I think that was really interesting that you mentioned because this is not this is not the first time we had a, a, a quarantine a pandemic that that stopped uh, uh, schools. Maybe on a worldwide level, it's it's rather new, but there has been epidemics in in local in local levels that that has uh, implications that ha that stopped schools, and we can learn from the, those experiences. And sometimes in in times of crisis, it the the non-state actors are the ones we can rely on instead of the state actors. Mm -hmm. And that's, I, I think, something we can learn um, not only from the pandemic, we can learn from other crises as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very interesting, Santiago. Uh, could you please uh, span a bit more if you know, I don't know, um, as for the Khan Academy case, I, I knew about it, I read a bit, but not much. So I'm not aware of if they have uh, recently because of the crisis, if they have some temporary agreement with public sector to offer their knowledge and their network and their capability. I have no idea, just out of the curiosity. Um, well, Khan Academy from uh, pretty much uh, uh, the start had a very strong uh, relationship with Google. Mm -hmm. I I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not I'm not a certain percent sure if if it was bought by Google or what is the nature of of the relationship. But mm -hmm. Khan Academy really had a, a very strong relationship with Google, and Google has a a, a very a strong history of trying to uh, coordinate with with uh, government organizations. In the case of Mexico, um, I I know states like. Uh, like Jalisco and uh, Nuevo Leon had uh, s certain um, meetings with with Khan Academy to incorporate it in the school system. Um, I'm not I, I, I'm not hundred percent sure what was the outcome of those meetings, mm -hmm. but what I do know is that in the United States, especially in the rural areas, uh, Khan Academy has had an outreach, uh, specifically with local communities and local governments, and that's. I think we, we're finding that um, the non-state actors in, in digital education are finding more su a success with uh, local governments than they are with, with state governments, um, federal governments. No, not that they don't have success with federal governments in all cases. It's just it, it, it tends to be more of a focus with local governments because the, 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 the projects are, are more, way more defined. Yeah. Thank you very much. So, Andres or Paola? I can continue, or Andres? Yes, uh, as you as you like. So, uh, yes, I, I just want to um, address that the importance of the mega universities in this context as big leaders of research and learning in in the pandemic. So uh, the question that you said me, uh, Paco, is, um, is important because right now we really don't know if these models are continuing in, uh, like in, a, in, a good, uh, in a good way. As we reflect each day, we need to connect uh, different uh, communities, uh, students, teachers, academics, administratives, and techniques uh, uh, for, from our communities. And uh, we need to, uh, uh, again, thinking about the context, the macroeconomic and also the microeconomics. Uh, Santiago and Cesar say something about local governments and also how the universities are discussing with them uh, the new goals of the society. So the principal objective of the universities is to be productive and to do a lot of people or even more the job people to be that they are productive uh, for this new economy and we are right now in a crisis. So we need to change 
as mega universities, also with the project of the societies and the economics. So there are uh, another question here in the forum that it's important that uh, how right now we can relate it with social values for, for promote uh, university education. Uh, the, the idea of the university is something that we need to regenerate it in the society. So it's not easy that the people believe in the university. So if you don't see nothing uh, like any vantage to study a four year degree program, the guys are not going to be continue the program. So we have Coursera as a good competitor that they give us one for one month, they give you an accreditation for some any for any specialization, and the guys can be get a, a job for there. So I think that the, the main challenge here for the universities and more for the mega universities is to connect again the interest to the people with these programs that what is the need to be a doctor for philosophy, for example. It's, it's something necessary for society right now, or we just need someone that give us responses for the techniques and, uh, and the solutions, like more, the more technical solutions. So yeah, I think uh, that it's important to rethink about the difference between mega and universities and the little ones, and even more the platforms that are not really universities, but there are a new uh, model of education and digital education that compete really, really hard with, with us. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, before, before I forget, for everyone who is listening to us, please post your question through the chat and we will be glad to, to pass through the, to the, to the commentators, to the panelists, sorry. Andres? Yes, Francisco, thank you. Um, I would like to address uh, a topic that um, Cesar, uh, Santiago, and Paola have already uh, kind of mentioned, is that um, this educational transition that we have seen in the last few months is more than just taking our presential classes and putting them in a screen. Uh, what we mean with this tr educational transition or to using this digital um, media for education uh, means the creation of infrastructure that uh, Cesar was already uh, commenting. And uh, also uh, the creation of this infrastructure uh, means uh, to assuming political costs of, of creating such infrastructure. Now, what, what I mean is not only for the, for, uh, the universities or the, or the governmental authorities to determine if um, our students or our teachers have the possibility to, to, to have a computer or a screen in which they can take courses such as um, such as the, the, the classes that Santiago were mentioning us, the, the, the crash core courses and the, um, uh, sorry, the Khan Academy courses and uh, also, also the courses that Paola mentioned, the Coursera courses, um, but also to think how this system or how these models for, um, for digital education can be adapted into a reality that we already have to not only um, present themselves as a solution for education during the pandemic to, to but to present themselves as a solution in a long-term, um, in, in a long-term policy for education, uh, not only in, in in developed countries, of course, but also um, in developing countries that may have a greater uh, challenges in creating edu education um, education programs, uh, and this sort of uh, of tools and of policies can be uh, the response to to create a, an educational network that can uh, provide us a, a solution for a lot of people that nowadays don't have the, the access to education. Uh, an example that I have also seen for, uh, here in Mexico to the solution that, uh, that lockdown represents uh, in, the, in, in public schools, not uh, here in, in, a, in an upper middle um, uh, education level, but to elementary and secondary school, the, 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 the federal government has decided to create uh, classes uh, via television. So um, it also represents the opportunity to, to create content 
of quality for people that don't really have a very a, quali a, a very good quality of education in their in, in their own schools. Uh, specifically, talking about persons that are uh, away from uh, the, the the main centers of uh, economic and cultural development, such as Mexico City, for example, in the case of Mexico, that um, uh, they can have this kind of content to to uh, contribute to the formation or to to the education that they already have. Thank you very much, Andres. Uh, let me check if there is any question in the in the chat box. If no, in the meantime, any of you, your panelists, you want to do some other complementary comments or something that you didn't mention before, Santiago? Um, I, I, I think Cesar wanted to talk. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yes. There are, <laughs> there are two, two questions. One of uh, one is from Alfredo. Um, is do you think that we face? Uh, there are three. Another one right now. So it's moving right now. Uh, let me move again the chat. <laughs> I can okay. see that. The, the last one is a, in the particular perspective of the countries. What are the advantages and opportunities we have on uh, on education now? So it's one of the questions for all the panel. I, if I uh, if I may, uh, Santiago, sorry, I'll, I'll go uh, first just uh, to to do a roundup uh, because I, I there is a point I wanted to mention also and I forgot, but uh, you you reminded me. Um, uh, and in terms of the budgeting, uh, coming back to this point of having uh, enough money, uh, when we wrote our strategy, digitization was perceived as a luxury. You know, it's like, uh, yeah, because we have so much money, we're, uh, you know, we want to do digitization while it, uh, other universities cannot do it. Uh, suddenly now, as, as you all know, it became a necessity. So that gives you a perspective of uh, how things were going. Um, when we used to argue uh, with our, uh, you know, um, uh, policymakers, but also with our faculty, about the the necessity of digitization. Uh, it wasn't perceived as a as a necessity. It was like uh, more of a luxury. It's because we have uh, a lot of money, we can uh, spend it on these things. Uh, now it is a necessity. So that's just to put um, things into perspective. Now to answer the question of Virginia uh, concerning the social values promoted. Uh, the, so she asked a question about the uh, social values that our university promotes and. Um, the profile of graduate of QU. Uh, you have to know that um, uh, as they, we are the only national university in town, the population of Qatar is made uh, a crushing majority by expats, which is the, the case also of uh, many countries in the region. Uh, however, we, have, we are the national university that has the highest percentage of international students. And the argument is very simple for uh, Qataris. It's that, you know, experts are here to help improve the country. So what they do is that they provide their kids with uh, an opportunity to study uh, because, uh, you know, uh, possibilities are limited. Uh, so uh, that, and you know, what that relates to the question of Virginia is that it shapes also the profile of the graduate of QU. While the national university would want, especially nationals to be, you know, um, going ahead and uh, uh, running the country and uh, given priority, of course, in all markets. For Qatar University, this component is a bit different. The profile is more of a person uh, in Qatar. Of course, priority is always given to nationals like any national university, but any graduate of Qatar University will be able to be shaped to um, do research and to be in leadership uh, positions uh, to improve or uh, to implement first the uh, priorities of Qatar as a nation, but also to improve the um, uh, impact of Qatar world regionally and worldwide. So that's in a nutshell, uh, the profile that we try to make uh, to provide our students with uh, the role of Qatar as the role of Qatar is not only national, the role of the graduates of Qatar University will not only be national. Uh, they will have to be also, uh, you know, well-rounded individuals who know about uh, what's happening in the world and the, uh, what, what Qatar is doing in that perspective. I, I will uh, let my other colleagues answer also their part of the other questions so that I don't monopolize the time and come back to uh, answer if you want me to. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, very very quick comment on on, on your uh, um, comment now, Cesar. And just out of curiosity, again, uh, which which are the nationality uh, from international student, uh, the majority uh, studying in in Qatar University now? And then the the second question is, as you mentioned, that uh, Qatar understand uh, investment in education as a soft power. And I study soft power in, in the American case. So I'm curious to know also um, how the the current situation in in American campuses and in American university um, very directly with the problem of visa that some student international student face to enter to get enrolled in American university. Is there any side effect of that uh, uh, those Trump restriction? for international students getting visa for American campus uh, affecting you in the numbers or, or not? Or? Yeah, uh, you know, for the, for the um, uh, first part uh, concerning, uh, if you remind me, what, what was the question on the first part, Francisco? The first, the first question is, um, which is the, the major, the, the yes, sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, Obviously, the majority is from the region, like uh, Middle Eastern uh, Egyptians, uh, uh, North Africans, mm -hmm. uh, regional. Even I know you know Qatar has been subject to a blockade from um, uh, four countries in the region. Uh, they are uh, blockading uh, the, their airspace even, on, uh, uh, and and the majority of students, of international students in our campus, come from these countries. In, uh, in fact. Um, so uh, basically, uh, we have a majority of international students coming from, uh, you know, Arab countries, but also a lot of um, uh, Indians, uh, Pakistanis, uh, le less Europeans, and uh, very few Latin Americans. I think it's like uh, maybe one or two students who are from Latin America. So uh, that's also an area that we would like to uh, to improve. We talked about that last year in in, uh, in, in Mexico. Um, uh, and we would like also to have more Spanish-speaking students for the sake of variety. Now, um, concerning the um, impact of Trump, we hoped, <laughs> just like our Canadian friends and our all of the, you know, everybody hoped that the Trump effect would uh, would uh, make their numbers, you know, uh, rise like hell. And uh, but still, uh, people still like to go to the states and are are ready to go through the hurdle of getting acceptance. Uh, in, a, in an American uh, university, which is already a very big headache uh, due to all the, the, the constraints and standardized tests. And on top now, after getting an acceptance, you know, getting a visa, uh, mm -hmm. people still prefer to do that. Uh, we are hoping that uh, you know, people come to us for a different reason uh, than, uh, than a Trump effect, but uh, we're still a young country. Uh, very young, in fact, with respect to others. Uh, and uh, we hope that with time, people will start to value uh, education uh, in the region in general and Qatar in particular. Thank you very much. Okay. I, I would like to answer sure. some questions. Go ahead. So, so I, I, th there is one thing that the, um, Paula mentioned uh, very briefly, and I think really, really important is um, Students also have an impact on the community. Uh, they actually work. In, in Mexico, uh, several studies said that around 50% of students uh, in colleges work uh, while they're studying. Uh, Georgetown University poll um, said that around, around that um, 50 to 70% of students enrolled in colleges are also working. Um, so when we have mega universities, that attract uh, many people from from the rural areas or from other countries uh, even they they they, they take a, a, a population that works and and that has a rather important level of of, of education of, of capacitation um, so that, that's really important that's that's one of the things and and Cesar mentioned uh, really really interestingly that the, even with, with the problems of visa and even with the problems that, that Trump represents for, for migration, uh, people are still willing to leave their countries and go to, to study to the, the, the universities. And I, I wanted uh, to know if, if it was the same, same in, in Qatar. 
that um, there, there is a, a, a rural uh, migration towards the cities, especially of students that are studying and working and taking away uh, the, the jobs they, are, they, they could be doing in rural communities they're doing now in, in, in universities. And um, so I think that's really important. And the, 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 the digital, the technological gap is it's huge. When, when you don't have the capacity of, uh, of studying in, in, in online because you don't have Wi-Fi, that, that's, that, is, that happens more in, in, in developing countries than it does in, in developed countries, then yes, you do have a, a very strong digital gap that limits your, your capacity for a digital transition. Anyone want to comment on these papers? I, I think Cesar, uh, I think that it's a good question from uh, that Santiago asked to Cesar about what happened with these rural areas and non <laughs> uh, per, and peripheric places in Qatar and also, well, in the Middle East. What happened with the countries not uh, that are not the core? Qatar, of course, is a core, but what happened with the other ones? What happened with uh, these rural areas? They are integrated. There are uh, different, big difference. As in Mexico, we have really big difference. Uh, just a little bit of the question of uh, Liz. We have in Mexico a lot of inequalities. So we as the, in the, in the Atuna, for example, we discussed what all these guys that are coming from all the states from our republic, they're coming, uh, they're sharing their knowledge in the digital education right now. So there are people from Oaxaca, there are indigenous people, there are people from the periphery of the city. So we have different contexts that are interesting in this, uh, in this moment. So mm -hmm. could we just uh, share us with some experiences? I can give you two perspectives, uh, one that is Qatar and one that is uh, Lebanon, my home, my home country. In Qatar, we don't have really a rural uh, population. Uh, the, the problems are more on the conservative and the openness uh, rather than rural and not rural. It's pretty much of a city state. Doha is the biggest city in town. It's a very well developed, you know, um, a modern city. Uh, most of the population uh, lives in the city. So it's, um, and the shift that has been made in Qatar from, um, uh, from um, uh, you know, the conservative kind of uh, uh, tribal uh, mode of life to uh, city life has been exceptional. It's in, the in the space of 20 years, you've had uh, people moving from, you know, uh, a life that is a very basic life to a modern city life. So we don't really have a big issue on that sense. It's about more conservatism than uh, than um, access. So do we want to open uh, the you know all this world to uh, to our kids, or do we want to keep our values and and have uh, you know more restriction on that? This is the issue in Qatar. Not really an issue of uh, uh, access in terms of being able to access or not having the infrastructure. In Lebanon, however, I don't know if you if you know the, the shape. In fact, the Middle East is a bit, you know, fragmented, pretty much like Mexico. You have a very rich area and you have more, you know, real life areas uh, that represent countries like Lebanon, where you have very um, advanced cities and uh, pretty much rural areas, as you were saying, uh, uh, you know, farmers um, uh, that are uh, really uh, in, in remote areas, although the country is small, it's, uh, it's made up of mountains, you know, uh, a lot of mountains. So these people also might have uh, no access to internet because of the, uh, the, 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 the way uh, the country is. So uh, yeah, and, and this part of the world, uh, we have the same issues as you, um, this part of the region. We have the same issues as you. It's about accessibility. It's about uh, being able to, you know, some 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 have big families. So when you have uh, the mother, the father who are working from home plus uh, six or seven kids in different classes, even if they have access to uh, to information technology, they still cannot really operate uh, in a normal setup where they'll be able to really grasp, follow all the courses. Uh, grasp all the material and then uh, have time to study. So yeah. uh, that, 
pretty much in a nutshell uh, what what is the situation here thank you very much Tersha, again for very clarifying comments anyone else any question uh, so I guess we are about to finish this uh, illuminating. Well, and Andres, I don't know if you want to add something because you are the only one. <laughs> um, if well, you want uh, to add. Uh, it's pretty much to 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 share with, um, with with people that are listening to that in Mexico. We we've also had this kind of experiences that Cesar talks about and uh, more uh, related with the Lebanon experience that um, we have been forced to 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 take into uh, our homes to our personal spaces, uh, how we take the classes, for example, here, my brother, uh, like some feet away from me, is uh, taking uh, architecture classes uh, in the next room. My father is uh, having, uh, he, he's also a teacher at another university, so he's also having classes, uh, all of us in, in the same spaces. And I think this is the reality in, in a lot of, of Mexican homes and other homes in, in, in around the world that uh, we have, uh, have had the, the experience to tackle this uh, difficulties that the pandemic has brought to us. Um, of course, not uh, not a lot of people has uh, the the opportunity to have like a personal space only dedicated for uh, their studies, for uh, having these kind of online classes, and to have a workspace only for their own. And uh, as I was talking in my uh, in, in 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 the presentation that I I did, um, m most of the people has uh, had the 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 necessity to share. Their, their media and their um, uh, and the resources they had uh, between them, the same family, even with other families, to to have access to this kind of of um, well, well the, of, of this education and to uh, work centers. And uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I think this experience from Mexico that uh, uh, it can be think of as a, a very diverse uh, countries such as economic diversity, uh, social diversity, and of course educational diversity. Uh, can also be taken into account to um, to create different opportunities for uh, other kind of um, of countries that have similar experiences from Mexico uh, to to work together to know uh, what we can take what uh, these opportunities or this pandemic has uh, presented itself as a as an opportunity to uh, develop different uh, a different model of education and to think how uh, we can take the the, the good things that the pandemic has brought us and, um, uh, and, and inserted them in the educational model that we already have. Anyone else? So, so I want to just to thank you, uh, Cesar and Andres and Santiago for being in this panel. And uh, well, Francisco, you are the moderator. <laughs> well, uh, again, thank you very much to all of you. It has been a very uh, nice, interesting uh, experience. And uh, we will continue with this open debate. Uh, in three weeks or so, we have another session about another uh, issue and another one more, because uh, for good or bad, it seems that we are going to be still trapped down in, in, in indoors. So <laughs> uh, I think uh, at least for the next month ahead, we should keep uh, collaborating and working remotely, which on the one hand has a, a positive uh, side. Perhaps without COVID, we would have the chance to talk with Cesar or with uh, Andres and Santiago, at least me. No? I already met a uh, new Paula, but not you. Uh, it has been a pleasure. Uh, it goes without saying, if I can help you in anything from Spain, please uh, drop a line and please keep it post keep, uh, keep in touch. Thank you very much. Uh, you. Take care and stay safe. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye. A nombre del CISAR, muchas gracias por su participación. Se les recuerda que en el chat está un vínculo para los asistentes que requieran una constancia. Se les recuerda que esta constancia solo es para los que participaron por parte de Zoom, no para los que están conectados desde YouTube. Muchas gracias por su asistencia. Hasta luego.